The book of Genesis, chapter 20. Hang on, it's the entire chapter. Now Abraham moved on from there into the region of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. For a while he stayed in Gerar. And there Abraham said of his wife Sarah, she is my sister. Then Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent for Sarah and took her. But God came to Abimelech in a dream one night and said to him, you're as good as dead because of the woman you've taken. She is a married woman. Now Abimelech had not gone near her, so he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And didn't she also say, he is my brother? I have done this with a clear conscience and clean hands. Then God said to him in the dream, yes, I know you did this with a clear conscience, and so I have kept you from sinning against me. That is why I did not let you touch her. Now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you and you will live. But if you do not return her, you may be sure that you and all who belong to you will die. Early the next morning, Abimelech summoned all his officials, and when he told them all that had happened, they were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham in and said, What have you done to us? How have I wronged you that you have brought such great guilt upon me and my kingdom? You have done things to me that should never be done. And Abimelech asked Abraham, What was your reason for doing this? Abraham replied, I said to myself, There is surely no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not of my mother, and she became my wife. And when God had me wander from my father's household, I said to her, This is how you can show your love to me. Everywhere we go, say of me, He is my brother. Then Abimelech brought sheep and cattle and male and female slaves and gave them to Abraham. And he returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, My land is before you. Live wherever you like. To Sarah he said, I am giving your brother a thousand shekels of silver. This is to cover the offense against you before all who are with you. You are completely vindicated. Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female slaves, so they could have children again. For the Lord had kept all the women in Abimelech's household from conceiving because of Abraham's wife, Sarah. This is the word of the Lord. Right on. Well, that is my favorite opening because I feel like Michael Jordan when I come out to preach, so that makes me super happy. Good to have you. My name's Adam Stabler. I'm a lead pastor here. Welcome to church. If you're a brand new visitor, just uh, please come up after the service. Say hi. We'd love to meet you. We are in a brand new sermon series. Not so much a brand new sermon series. Uh, this is the probably the fourth time we've gone into this. We drop sermon series like Netflix here, so you get a binge watch it for eight weeks, and then we're off until the next year when it comes out again, and we do another one. And we've been following Genesis through a whole bunch of uh, different stories and uh, Old Testament narrative history, and we're uh, now to Abraham. Now, we met Abraham in our last series, and I want to catch you up a little bit about who Abraham is. Also want to challenge you, if you haven't read through Genesis in a while, jump back into it. I read it during the month of January. That's really going to help you with the sermon series to know what's going on, so I don't have to do a lot of the framework. You're going to have some of that yourself. So dive into it and follow along with me on that. Abraham was a man who lived east of Iraq. Uh, he was the first Jew ever. He wasn't a Jew, but he became the first Jew ever, the first Hebrew ever. God made him a Hebrew. And he lived on the other side of the Euphrates, which is way off in the east on the way over to, basically over to India. God found him, and he found one person who he could start his restoration project for humankind. He found one person, and he makes a promise to that one person, Abraham, that I'm going to turn you into a great nation. That's what he says to him. And so God goes and finds a person. Now, I've always thought it was interesting. God could have done this with a Native American. He could have done it with somebody from the island of Japan. He could have made this narrative work in any way he wanted and changed all the customs and the rule. He could have done whatever he wanted, but this is what he chose to do with this particular person. And in this story, we find someone who God gets a hold of who's super raw. And like Abraham... Uh, he's like any of you. I mean, Abraham could have sat in our congregation and you could have been Abraham or Sarah or Sarai, which was her original name. Any of you could have been in the Bible because the Bible is just full of normal people. But God takes him on this incredible adventure and Abraham is slow in learning. At 100 years old, we find him here about 100 years old, he's, he's still kind of figuring it all out in this story. And so God has him, and then God sends him out from his family. He goes, you got to leave your family. I want you to take off. And he takes his wife, who actually is his half-sister. Now, 
he had that arrangement happening before God got into the picture. So you're like, oh, what does that happen? Is that, can you do that today in the Bible? The Bible, when the Levitical law comes around, God gets a hold of him later on in the story. He's like, not cool. But at the time, that's who Abraham was. And so we see Abraham leveraging this relationship that he had that was very common back in his day before he crossed the Euphrates over into you know, the land. He ends up in the promised land. Uh, ends up actually at Jerusalem, at the tip of Jerusalem, as we know, uh, getting ready to sacrifice his son Isaac. But as God sends him here, he leverages this truth, which is kind of a half-truth. And I titled your, your uh, sermon, because my daughter said to me, can you start titling the sermons with better sermons again? Because I have to put them on Instagram, and I need better sermon titles. So well, here's what we came up with. The Sinister Sister Sin. A little bit of alliteration there, right? He starts telling people, he does this twice, he starts telling people, this is my sister, and he does it for one reason or another. And so Abraham gets sent out, and God says, take off with your wife, and don't take anybody with you. Uh, and so he immediately leaves, and he takes his nephew, Lot. This causes all kinds of problems, we know about that, you can follow up on that. Um, then God meets him and says, I have a covenant. And there's two different times, the first time he comes, he says there's a promise, and then he makes a covenant with him. I'm gonna do this, you're gonna have a great nation, I'm gonna bring a son from your wife, and he's all excited, that happens, he gets that promise, and then it's a long time until the promise comes. And there's probably disappointment and all kinds of trying ways to try to make the promise happen outside of waiting on God. We do that a lot, right? There's this promise, we feel like we have this talent or this ability, and then we step into it to make it happen, and you see that happen all the time. Lot gets in trouble. Lot and Abraham have to separate. Lot moves to Sodom and Gomorrah, and that goes wrong, and Abraham has to come in and save Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah. You guys know the story. You can finish on there. And then um, in, Isaiah, in Genesis 15, 6, we have this incredible verse where God comes and says, we're going to do a, another covenant with you, but this is a covenant of circumcision. You can just Google that if you want. I don't need to explain it to you. And um, he says, we're going to do this covenant of circumcision. And then in, in Genesis 15, 6 is this paramount verse. It's probably one of the key verses, if not the key verse of faith, that all of the rest of our faith is built upon, believing that Jesus died on the cross and everything. In Genesis 15, 6, Abraham says this. He says, Abraham believed the Lord, and God credited it to him as righteousness. That's huge. Because of his belief, God made him righteous. He cleansed him of his sins and made him righteous because of his belief, which is so, so interesting. We'll get more into that this summer when we're in, in the book of Romans, but we see that happen. So we have gotten to the place then right after that where the promise hasn't happened, and Sarah is getting a little, Sarai at the time, is getting a little frustrated. And she says, hey, I, I'm getting old. I can't have children. I've got a maidservant. Why don't you marry her and make her and then have a baby with her? Not a great plan, okay? I don't know if any of you have thought through that, but it's just not a great plan. And so she does, and Hagar has a child. Well, God had made a promise about the first child, and then so God is bound to some promises. The actual Arab nation comes from Hagar. That is Ishmael, and God has promised that, you know, that the Arab nation, they believe, you know, comes from that line, and you can look more into that and Google that. And so here we are, all that has ended. They're waiting on the covenant. Isaac, his son, his real son from Sarah, has not been born, all right? So that's the backstory. And you probably, that was the, the two-minute version of it. But as we look at it, I want you to go back and check that out. Because here we're at a place where Abraham's just chilling and waiting for the promise. And in the midst of that, he moves to Gerar. And when he's in Gerar, he gets a little concerned. Because Sarah was this very, really beautiful woman. She's younger than him. And he's afraid that he's going to be killed because they'll just kill him and take her as their wife. That's just kind of how they rolled back then. And so he says, you know, hey, just do this thing. Just say you're my sister and don't tell him you're my wife. And then he allows his wife to be taken. This happens twice. It happens in Egypt as well, where he just allows his wife just to go off with some other dude because he's afraid that he's going to get killed. Not a lot of honor in that. And so that's what we see. Now, today the sermon, after that backstory, takes a minute to reset the sermon series up. We're talking about sin, we're talking about temptation. And I've been wanting to talk about temptation and talking about how to actually fight against temptation and how to deal with the sin in your life. And so we're gonna take a look at sin today and the sin of Abraham, who obviously is the patriarch of the faith. I mean, you go all the way back, he's the one God started with. And so you can probably find yourself in some of the muddied waters of his life, but realize that God can redeem that and that Genesis 15, 6 is super important 
He believed God and God credited to him as righteousness. Well, we believe that Jesus died on the cross and God credits it to us as righteousness. So, two points today. First point is this. There are no victimless sins. There are no victimless sins. You might want to be think to yourself that I can just sin and do my thing and no one's going to get hurt, no one knows about it. It's really clear there are no victimless sins. There's always a victim, even if that victim is just you, but I would say it always goes beyond you. And number two, sin always has a reason. It always has a good reason. Most of the time, not all the time, but there's always a good reason why we should step outside of what God calls us to, to do something for one reason or another. So two things, there are no victimless sins, and sins always have a reason. I put in the notes that we willingly sin for two primary reasons. I spent a good seven minutes trying to figure out other reasons. I couldn't come up with any other reasons. And so the two that I came up with are this. We sin to save or to satiate ourselves. We sin for two reasons. One, to save ourselves. This is what Abraham's doing here, right? There's a problem, and so he needs to save himself. He needs to lie on his taxes. He needs to uh, falsify his records. He needs to do something with his you know, whatever, it's his CV so he can get a job. He needs, whatever the reason is, he needs to save himself. He's not willing to wait for God. And so one of the main reasons we sin is to save ourselves. And this is really a good reason, right? There's usually a good reason. And the second reason is just to satiate ourselves. It's for pleasure. It's to do what we want, to live according to our stomachs, to get something we want. Why? Because we want it. And isn't there no better reason than that, right? We just want it. So you want it, and you're going to get it. The maturity of the faith are people who learn how to deal with that and to move on to higher levels of self-control and holiness. And we actually see Abraham do this, and God can do this in your life as well. Go to verse 3 and 4. We're into the scripture now, and that was a big setup, but uh, I'm trying to catch you up on 20 chapters. There are no victim of sins. Verse 3 and 4. But God came to Ambimelech in a dream one night, and he said to him, you're as good as dead because of the woman you have taken. Stop right there. Imagine that. That'll wake you up, won't it, right? (laughs) This kind of stuff happens all the time in our culture, right? It just happens all the time. Maybe it's not a king that you're, you know, this has happened where there's adultery or things are happening world's gone really sideways in regard to sexuality. I don't know if you've noticed that. Pretty sideways. This is pretty sideways. And God shows up to Ambivalek in a dream, and he goes, yeah, by the way, you're a dead man, is one of the translations. I'm like, wow, that is some high drama there. And um, I think that's true for all sin. Sin, it says in the scripture, leads to death. It just doesn't immediately lead to death. In this point, in this place, in Ambivalek's life, God was going to be like, it's going to immediately lead to death. And it wakes him up. And it says, uh, as you go there, you're dead because, you have, because the woman you have taken, she's a married woman. Now Ambimelech had not gone near her, so, she, so he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? That's really, really interesting. If you go on another verse or two, there's a really interesting scripture that I also found a correlation to in, in Psalms this week, in the Psalm this week, where it said, um, he goes on to say, um, Uh, Yes, I go to verse 6, actually. I just want to show you. This was really, really interesting. little side note. God says to Ambulet, yes, I know you did it with a clear conscience, so I have kept you from sinning against me. Wow. That's actually in the psalm. That is is in the psalm as well. That's a great prayer. Now, I think we need to obviously exert our own self-control and self-agency, and God wants to partner with us. But if you don't have into your caveat of prayers, God help me to, stop, to not sin against you or save me from sin, add that to your prayer. It seems like there's different things where God does this. You see this in the scripture. So I just wanted to give that to you as a side note in regard to dealing with sin. Ask, begin to ask God to help you with temptation, but then also to ask you, God, keep me from sinning against you. Do little things. Frustrate my plans. Whatever it is, frustrate me as I go to sin. That's one of the ways, and we'll talk about ways at the end of this to attack. I said there's no to attack sin. There's no victimless sins. You can think that you're in the lab just kind of working on things and, you know, of your own sin. It's never going to get outside of the lab, but, but then it does. And the story I was thinking about is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. I don't know if you've read Frankenstein. It is such a complex novel. It's way better than the movies. The movies kind of ruin it. And there's a modern-day version of Frankenstein. And uh, 
where there's this man, and he's in the lab, right? And he's just trying to just mess with things a little bit, but then it gets out of control, and he can't control the consequences. I watched this a lot in the 70s. Throw it down. Everyone in their 40s, 50s, and 60s is like, yeah, let's go. I love that. <laughs> so good, getting thumbs up from the back. Yeah, that's just a ripoff of Mary Shelley's novel, FYI, except the Frankenstein actually did commit the murder. Why do I say that? Why do I show that? We are so think that we can be in a lab with our sin and just we think about it, we, we connive it, we figure out ways that no one knows about it. Like sin's usually in the darkness. It's getting more out into the light because we have a culture that glorifies sin and hates goodness. But in our own lives, we do that. And we think that there won't be any consequences to that. And what you see in that and what you see in that story is all of a sudden it goes sideways. I have never found 